said about animal experimentation these days. Basically, there are two schools of thought. On the one hand, we have the anti-vivisectionists and the anti-speciesism and animal rights groups who claim that animal testing is not only unethical, but completely useless because, as Thomas Harting said, we're not 70 kilogram rats. On the other hand, we have the pro-human, pro-life, and quite often self-declared pro-science groups who hinge their arguments on the value of human life and on the importance of animal experiments in some of the most important discoveries in biomedical science. So, in the name of scientific progress and for the benefit of humankind, they claim that animal experiments are essential because we do, after all, share more than 90% of our genes with mice. The two groups basically represent two contrasting ideologies, and they present their arguments using data from different sources. But they only choose the data that match their views while ignoring all the rest. This is a well-known behavioral phenomenon known as confirmation bias. For instance, the first group often cite the fact that 92% of drugs that are tested on animals fail when they're used in humans. The data comes from a 2004 FDA report, which actually states that only 8% of drugs which are used in the first phase of clinical testing go on to be sold in the market. In reality, only one in 5,000 of the chemical compounds developed for pharmaceutical purposes actually end up being sold on the market because most of them are rooted out long before being tested on animals. The second group quite often remind us that vaccines such as polio, tuberculosis, measles and hepatitis B, as well as medicines and antibiotics, which have saved the lives of millions of people, were developed thanks to animal experiments. This is quite true, but they don't mention drugs like thalidomide, which was sold as an anti-nausea drug to pregnant women in the 1950s and, ca and caused severe limb deformities in over 10,000 newborn babies. Or other drugs like Vioxx and rosclitazone, which caused tens of thousands of heart attacks. But without doubt, animal experiments were necessary to understand. No, sorry. <laughs> but if we look at the overall evidence, we cannot reasonably state that animal experiments are useless. In fact, we know that infant mortality has declined, whereas life expectancy has increased considerably over the past 100 years. This is partly due to access to clean water, sanitation and hygiene. But particularly since the 1950s, it's due to progress in medical science. I can cite several examples, not just drugs and vaccines. For instance, kidney, heart and liver transplants, vascular prostheses, stents, um, hip and knee replacements. To give you an example, the uh, Nobel Prize winning surgeon Joseph Murray er experimented on 600 dogs before safely starting with human kidney transplants. Today, 80,000 80, people all over the world receive a kidney transplant every year. Transplants and implants were aided by the discovery of anticoagulants, such as heparin, which was first extracted from the livers of dogs in the 1930s. And we don't even need to go so far back in time. For example, the Nobel Prize winning Japanese scientist Yamanaka was able to generate induced pluripotent stem cells from the cells of adult mice in 2006. These cells are now considered as a promising method for curing several illnesses and have revolutionized biomedical research today. So without doubt, animal experiments were necessary to understand what could happen in the human body and, help lead, have, and, help, and have helped lead to many of the scientific discoveries that we all benefit from today. But note that I said to understand what could happen in the human body not what does happen. That's because um, our hypothesis is based on the fact that animals and humans are similar. So it's quite often possible to predict what would happen to, in a human based on observations made on a rat 
or another animal. That is, the animal is an approximation of a human being. In fact, for 91% of the, experiments carried, of the exper animal experiments carried out on the, uh, in the EU, the animal is a model of a human being. So it's then up to us to extrapolate the results obtained in the lab to humans, accepting the risks and limitations associated with the model. A hundred, and even 10 to 15 years ago, animal experiments were necessary simply because we didn't have appropriate technology to even think of doing otherwise. We couldn't even dream of engineering 3D bio-artificial systems in the lab. We couldn't even think of replicating the metabolic or physiological functions of a human or even an animal using a cell culture. But today, we not only dream and think about it, we're actually trying to replicate those very functions in our labs. But just because we can't actually, we're just because we're thinking of doing it at the moment, it doesn't mean that we should just stop there and carry on using animals to test drugs, chemicals, and um, uh, human diseases using animals like our predecessors did. I'm going to use an analogy to help you answer this question. This is the first time I've been to Taranto. We hired a car and drove here from Brindisi Airport using the navigation app on my mobile phone. A hundred years ago, I'd perhaps have arrived here in a horse carriage and used a paper map to get here. In the past hundred years, we've made huge progress in our navigation technology. Just think about it. Thousands of years ago, our ancestors used the, map, um, used the stars to figure out where they were and where they were going. Then we started using tools like the compass, paper maps, clocks, and radio. The GPS system was developed in 1973, and by 2004, people had started using it in handheld units known as tom-toms. Today, almost everybody has a GPS receiver embedded in their mobile phones, and we know our position to an accuracy of a few meters, and we can navigate to almost anywhere on Earth. In other fields, such as robotics, we can make robots that see, that assemble cars, and that even talk to each other. Our parents and grandparents wouldn't have even dreamed of um, communicating robots and inbuilt navigation in mobile phones. But we've not only dreamed about these, we've actually built machines, devices, and technologies that substitute humans in simple and boring tasks. So what stops us? from thinking of building device, machines, devices, and technologies that substitute laboratory mice. Technologically, we're at a turning point in biomedical research today. We could, on the one hand, using a navigation analogy, stay with the stars and maps, on the basis that no human or animal can possibly be simulated using a computer or represented using a cell culture. And so we can continue to use animals as models of humans and human diseases, just like we've done for over 100 years. Or we could move from simple cell cultures and adopt new technologies and new tools, like those using human-induced pluripotent stem cells that have the potential to generate a mini intestine, like Hans Kleber showed in 2009, or a mini liver organoid, like Takibi showed, in 2013. We can use um, advanced material fabrication technology to create um, blood vessel-like channels between one organoid and another so that they can communicate, much like they do in our bodies. These engineered systems can replace animal models, but they're still models, and so it'll still be necessary to critically analyze the results and then translate them to the human context. Just like animal models, we'll have to accept the risks and limitations associated with them. The difference is that these engineered models can be continuously improved and optimized, for example, by using um, cells from a patient in order to predict his or her personalized response to a therapy. On the other hand, the biology of a mouse is fixed 
and unchangeable. You might ask then, do we still need animal models today? In many areas of research, like toxicology, when we need to evaluate the toxic or harmful effects of a substance according to the amount we're exposed to, probably not. Most toxicity experiments in animals are already accompanied by in vitro tests because they help reduce the number of animals used. We now know that cell cultures are simpler and more precise for evaluating the cancerous or genotoxic effects of a chemical compound than animals. That's because the biological mechanisms of genotoxicity can be analyzed step by step, first in single cells and then in groups of cells. But we do still need animals to study some of the more complex organs and systems, like the immune system, the endocrine system, and high-level brain function. Today, it would be impossible to evaluate how a vascular prosthesis made out of a new biomaterial will be integrated into the body. But using the tools and technologies that we have today, developing them further on, we will soon be able to model biomaterial inter interaction in a mini-organ in the lab and combine it with a computational model of blood flow in human arteries. Using this type of combined technology, it's highly likely that in the next few years we'll be able to uh, model the biointegration of a new implant with even greater precision than we currently do in dogs and sheep. So, based on past evidence, it's unreasonable to sustain that animal experiments have served no purpose. But it's also irrational to maintain that we have no better way of modeling the human body. Armed with the technology we have today, just like we've changed our navigation tools, it's time to change the tools of experimental biology. Not for one ideology or, or another, but for the benefit of humanity, animals, and scientific knowledge. Thank you. <laughs>